In the aftermath of Roger Federer's inspiring victory at the 2018 Australian Open where he lifted his record 20th Grand Slam trophy, a number of questions have arisen. One of which is whether the victory closes the debate as to whether Federer is the greatest tennis player of all time. And I posted a video on this very topic a couple of days ago in response to which I'm getting some very insightful and informative viewer comments. So insightful and so informative in fact that I'm going to post a separate video discussing these comments. But there's another question raised by the victory and it's the question of just how Roger Federer was able to achieve such greatness in his career. How was he able to attain this greatness, to, be, to become the greatest tennis player of all time? And what can we learn from Federer in this regard? Well, I have a theory of greatness, and it goes something like this. Greatness is not achieved, at least not in large part, through gradual, incremental improvements over time that gradually lead to greatness. No, greatness comes about in large part as a result of decisive, dramatic, breakthrough moments where immense amounts of change occur in short periods of time that essentially transform the person in question into greatness embodied or into a great person, a great athlete, whatever the field is. And this is the right way to think about Roger Federer's career. There have been two decisive breakthrough moments in his career where immense amounts of change in his game have occurred and which have propelled him into greatness. One of them, of course, is the 2017 comeback. And I'm doing some research right now on that topic and hope to be uh, posting a video giving you the essential information about why and how Roger was able to execute this comeback. So look for that. That's coming down the pike. But today I want to focus on the first decisive breakthrough moment in Roger Federer's career that enabled him to achieve the world number one for the first time in 2004. So the breakthrough happens in the 2003-2004 period because the backdrop for the world number one ranking in 2004, of course, is the Wimbledon victory in 2003. Then he won the Tour Finals in 2003 as well. Then, of course, he went on to win the Australian, and that resulted in his first number one ranking. But it was a breakthrough. There was immense amounts of change. It, it was a new tennis player at the All England Club in 2003 in many respects. A breakthrough had occurred. Federer struggled in the early years of his professional career. He was a superstar as a juniors uh, player, but once he turned professional, he really did struggle. Um, in his uh, first 36 tournaments, he lost in the first round of 21 of those tournaments. Uh, he was continually disappointing. Now, don't get me wrong, he was doing fine and he was rising slowly through the ranks and People certainly noticed him and had very high expectations uh, about his future. So, you know, you know, John McEnroe was actually predicting he would win Wimbledon in 2002. Actually, Federer struck out in the first round in Wimbledon in 2002. But there were a lot of expectations that surrounded Federer. Uh, but nevertheless, he disappointed time and time again. He was an emotional person. He let the emotions uh, get the better of him often. And uh, there were other problems, other handicaps that he had to break through. And I want to break, uh, break down just what those handicaps were and just how he broke through them. My name is Aaron Knapp. Welcome to Tennis Talk Daily, where you will get essential commentary on professional tennis uh, delivered on a daily basis subscribe to the channel to receive the videos. And uh, if you like what you see in here, please give this video a thumbs up. So again, Roger was a star as a junior uh, tennis player, but once he became professional, uh, he did struggle. And there were, there were some Davis Cup successes to be sure, and he did slowly start to rack up some titles beginning in 2001. Uh, but there were a lot of disappointments, and he did not live up 
to the the promise and potential that many people uh, attributed to him. But something happened at Wimbledon in 2003. He broke through. Uh, He came through Wimbledon and lifted that trophy, uh, having dropped only one set. It was virtually a new man at the All England Club in 2003. So the question is, what happened? How did he make this breakthrough? Uh, What are the factors uh, that explain this breakthrough? Well, I think there are five factors, the first three of which are the most important. The first factor, Federer was able finally to start controlling his emotions. He's a very emotional guy. I mean, to this date, he's a very emotional guy. Uh, We can see this when he lifts his trophies, uh, lifted the Australian Open trophies, and the tears um, uh, roll down his cheeks. He is an emotional person. Now he reserves it, however, primarily for the end of tournaments when he wins. And it comes out in a sort of tears of joy the emotion is joy rather than anger, but early in his career, he had a lot of anger issues and he would get angry at himself on the court. The anger would then turn into fear of losing. The fear of losing would then materialize. He would become humiliated, embarrassed. Later, he would become guilty. And this was kind of the vicious cycle. It's anger, fear, embarrassment, humiliation, guilt, anger, fear, humiliation, embarrassment, guilt. Uh, And he realized, and it was in the 2002-2003 period that he realized that this was just not going to work and he had to completely exclude emotions from his game. Now, the Roger we know is that stoic, unemotional Roger, uh, the ruthless, unemotional tennis player that is totally committed to the moment and to the game, not to any emotions, but to to winning. Uh, That's the Roger we know now, and that's the result of this initial breakthrough. But he had to have that breakthrough. He had to come to the realization there was a key match in 2002 against Franco Squillari in which he had a a, a serious breakdown, but he regretted it. And it was one of the key moments where he decided, you know, he can't do it anymore. He's not going to be able to break through and and get Grand Slam victories if he lets his emotions um, control him. Another key match was that first round Uh, French Open defeat just a few months before he won Wimbledon in 2003, where he lost in the French Open to Louis Lorna. But that was a very traumatic match. Again, the the emotions were not so visible that day, but they were occurring within Federer, and the emotions again controlled him. Those two uh, matches in particular are critical moments um, in which Roger came to the decision and through a force of will decided that he was no longer going to be emotional on the court. The second factor in explaining this breakthrough, uh, the integration of his shots into into a cohesive style and approach. Uh, Many of Federer's early coaches and observers noted uh, his the great variety in his shot making the level of skill uh, and but in particular the great variety and John McEnroe said well he's got so much variety that he's confusing himself his earlier coach Peter Carter said he's got this great repertoire of shots but he needs a way to put them together Federer needed an organizing principle and what he realized Again, I think it was after that French Open match, but it was something uh, of a. Pro- it was a process that kind of happened in the first six or seven months of 2003. He realized that the key to integrating his game was going to be to access his instincts, to to rely on his instincts, and to be afraid no more of his instincts and just go with his gut on the court and that's what he started doing but he he also realized that in order to do that he had to get totally absorbed into the moment in order to access that instinct and that organizing principle that can sort of organize those shots into into a cohesive whole he had to get totally absorbed into the moment not think about you know, previous games or even future games in the match, let alone future matches in a particular tournament. He had to play one point at a time and each point was its was a new match in the in in the way he approached it. Uh, point by point, match by match, and to not start getting out of the moment. He had to be totally committed 
to the moment. That was the way to access his instinct, and that was on display as early as Halle in 2003, but certainly during the Wimbledon Championships of 2003. A third factor in explaining Roger's breakthrough, initial breakthrough moment, is adversity. He had some experiences uh, with adversity in the couple of years leading up to this comeback. First, his boyhood coach, uh, Peter Carter, died very abruptly and tragically. Um, was very traumatic for Federer, but he suddenly found purpose. This adver he used this adversity, he found purpose, and almost immediately he started playing better. I mean, it took him a while to get over the death, but within a month or two, he was excelling in Davis Cup matches, and it was almost a new man based on the death of Peter Carter. He wanted to pay tribute to Carter. He wanted to make sure that he lived up to the potential that Carter always stated that he had. So it gave him a new sense of purpose. Another little piece of adversity here uh, occurred in the Wimbledon Championships of 2003 where Roger threw his back out before his fourth round match with Feliciano Lopez and had excruciating back pain. Well, uh, he played through the back pain. Again, the adversity was something he looked at as something he needed to just overcome and tackle and conquer. And it actually made him play better. Um, he prevailed in that match. Uh, it was kind of narrowly, but it was in straight sets. Uh, he fought through the pain. That was adversity. And then finally, um, at the finals, um, the crowd wasn't with him at the finals, the, the tour finals in 2003. He had made some critical comments about the tournament and the conditions and the the, the main funder of the match, the financier who invested in these tournaments, uh, came out against Federer, tried to get the crowds working against him, uh, and Federer here again in this adversity. He'd never really experienced a situation before where everyone was against him. Well, he had some confidence coming off Wimbledon, but the circumstances of adversity here propelled him to greatness. For the first time, he prevailed over Nalbandian. For the first time, he knocked out Andre Agassi, and it was a real breakthrough moment. The two other factors in his uh, breakthrough uh, are, uh, first, the physical fitness training that he started in 2001, and that was basically a three-year plan. He was in the midst of it when he started having this breakthrough. Uh, the physical fitness was very important, and he took it very seriously. Um, just fitness training, basically fitness training, incorporating that as a routine matter throughout the year, not as some place players would do it just at, at various times squeezing it in. It became a core part of his training. So he was able to survive the longer matches. The fitness training was important. And then finally, the great expectations that surround Federer. Everybody thought he was going to win a Grand Slam long before he did. For some reason, everybody had utmost confidence in Federer. And this gave him confidence in himself. But when he disappointed people and struck out in the first round of these matches, it hurt a lot because he had let these people down. So all these great expectations um, inspired Federer to try to vindicate them. He had those great expectations for himself too, but he didn't want to let people down anymore. And that's where the tears came from when he lifted that trophy at Wimbledon in 2003. So those are my factors uh, that explain Roger's first breakthrough. Uh, control over his emotions, integration of his shots, uh, adversity to some extent that propelled him to greatness, the physical fitness training, and then finally the great expectations that surrounded him. Let me know what you think if you think there are other factors. I hope this has been informative. Definitely look for this next video where I'm going to do an analysis of just how he was able to execute this astonishing comeback. It's a great story as I'm learning about it and I'm excited to, to relate it to you. Subscribe to the channel and give the video a thumbs up um, if you like what you see in here. Um, and I look forward to talking with you soon. Uh, best wishes. Bye-bye.